here to give God some praise. Acceptance, sure we'll find it here. Authenticity in this atmosphere. Anticipation with a lot of action. We take it so far. Welcome to the lighthouse, lighthouse. Let me introduce you to my father. Welcome to the lighthouse, lighthouse. His name is Jesus the Christ. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Take Action. I am Pastor Keon Henderson. I give leadership to the Lighthouse Church in Houston, Texas. You are where you are, and I am glad that we are here together. I just want to give a shout out to all of our partners throughout the world. You know, we look, and I'm matter of fact, I'm going to go right now on uh, some of the things that we have on our Instagram, and I'm going to start giving shouts, shout outs to some of the people in some of our most familiar area. So give me a second to get in my insight. Like this is like real time. As of right now, they are telling me uh, that our biggest location obviously is Houston, Texas. So big shout out to Houston. But right under Houston, as of this moment, Lagos, Nigeria. Big shout out to Lagos. Under that, New York, the state of New York. Um, then the city of New York. Under that, Chicago, Illinois. Atlanta, Georgia, I want to give a shout out to you. Countries, obviously the United States, Nigeria, but look at our third most populated country, South Africa. Big, big shout out to all of our friends there in South Africa, United Kingdom and Ghana. To wherever you are around the world, uh, first of all, we want to send our prayers and thoughts to you. And um, if you are ever in the Houston area, come by one of our campuses. We would love to host you here. Today, I'm going to take a slight turn and, and kind of put my claws into an idea that I had. I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if I gave people my reviews or my thoughts on some of the most read books uh, that are out there? And I thought that I would come and talk with you about a book that I have read several times and that maybe you have read several times and maybe we can find uh, something in it together. I wanna to talk about my reviews on Think and Grow Rich. My reviews on Think and Grow Rich. And as we think about the book Think and Grow Rich, um, millions and millions of copies sold. In fact, one of my mentors uh, suggested that some of his success uh, is found right here in this book. And, and I thought that it was important enough to talk about today. So um, I want to I wanna kind of take not a deep dive, maybe a shallow dive into a book that will prompt you to go and get your own information. But the reason why I wanted to do it is because there are all of these self-help books. You know what I'm finding out? It ain't nothing but the Bible written in a different way. And so I'm going to show you uh, some correlations that I think there are a lot of self-help books that we push as Christians off of the shelves because we think, you know what? A pastor didn't write that or a theologian didn't write that, so there's no efficacy in it. But what you're not recognizing is that a lot of these authors are mimicking the Word of God and you're missing great value because it isn't the Bible. There are some other books that can help you learn and grow, and I think that Think and Grow Rich is one of those books. The first thing that I extrapolated from it uh, is that if you're going to think and, and when I say grow rich, I want to expand that topic because for some of you, rich isn't money. For some of you, wealth is health, right? Just, just ask somebody, what do you want? I just want my family to be healthy and prosper, all of those things. So I want you to put your own definition of what rich is to you or wealth is to you. But, and I'm going to show you how to think and grow into that. Uh, number one, if you're going to think and grow, um, here's my first review. You have to have a desire that is backed up by determination. You have to have a determined desire. Do you know how many people want things? Like, okay, let, let me show you what I mean by that. Um, take action, family. I want a billion dollars right now.
Oh, so you don't get what you want. Because I don't have it. And trust me, I really want it. But it's not here. Because you don't get what you want. You get what you picture. You get what you're determined to go after. You get what you develop. You get what you desire that is backed up by determination. Let me give an example that's in the book. During the gold rush in the mid 1800s, there was a family that discovered gold in Colorado. And those who read the book know exactly what I'm talking about. But they didn't have the machinery to dig up the gold. So here's what they did. They all combined their money, got all their resources together, and, and the family bought the machines that was necessary to get the gold. Are you with me so far? Now, they started digging. They started digging, but they couldn't find the gold. They gave up, sold all of the machinery to another company. The family that purchased the machinery started the digging process and struck gold after digging for three feet. <laughs> this family dug and 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 decided it ain't gonna happen. Pack up, sell the machine. Now, I'm already knowing as an economics major that they've lost money because the depreciating value of the machines that they bought, which means they didn't get for the machines what they paid for. So just to give you um, um, a, a type, just say they paid $100 for the machinery just to give you an even number. By the time they sold it after using it, they probably got 40 to 50% of that, if that. It's like you buying a car. You drive it off the lot, 20% of the value stays on the lot. So they actually lost money and time. And they dug and they dug and they dug. And they sold the machines. The other family walks in, buys the machines, digs 36 inches, and obtains the riches that the other family would have gotten had they not given up. How many things will somebody else enjoy that you worked for because you quit too quick on the process? Luke 14, 28 says, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down and first count the cost whether he has enough to finish. Before you start anything, you don't need to be asking yourself, can I start? What you need to be asking yourself is, can I finish? Because everybody can start. Every race has a field of starters. but it doesn't always have as many finishers. Jesus even warned his closest friends saying, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. What does that show us? That Jesus learned to stay focused in spite of the details. <laughs> oh, this is so good to me. So, so imagine you're going through your life right now and all of this stuff is happening. You, you, the doctor's report is bad. The kids are going through this. The, the, the husband doesn't know if he wants to be there. The wife doesn't know if she wants to be there. Uh, 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 just, just all depression shows up, financial problems, career changes, uh, industry shift. You got all this stuff going on and all of that can mess with your determination. And what Jesus is showing us, he knew that he was going to be betrayed. He knew that he had to die. He knew that he was going to be scandalized. And yet he says, I must need suffer the cross, which shows us that Jesus himself has given us an example that you have to stay focused in spite of the details. Come on. Like, I know it's hard for you right now. 
It's been hard for me. But you have to stay focused. Not too long ago, we had a staff meeting. And uh, one of our staff members was telling us about a conversation they had about me at a barbershop. And this person has been with us the entire time that we had the church. And he met some people who found out about our ministry just a few years ago. And they had some ideas and some thoughts about who they thought I was. Now we've never met, but they've only known of our ministry for a few years. The person who I've worked with said, no, that's not the guy that I know because I met him when he didn't have anything. What I want you to know is that I am more, and I want to use the right word, I am more indebted to my beginning than I am my progress. Had I not grown up in Gary, Indiana, to a mother who made $7 an hour working at Taco Bell, and you may be tired of hearing the story, but I'd much rather tell you my history than brag about my destiny. You were not there when we were riding in a green station wagon where the seats, the entire front seat, had to come up together. Y'all, because it wasn't no power seats. You had to grab a rail on the bottom of the seat and you had to get cooperation with everybody on the road and you had to count one, two, three, and everybody had to slide up together. You were not there when I had a sewage pipe in my bedroom that didn't have a lid on it. So every time the toilet was flushed, the fumes from the toilet would be in my bedroom. You were not there at my first church at 21 years old when there was no heat in the building in Indiana where it gets below zero. And I had church and preached when I could see the condensation coming out of my mouth. And you were not there after six months the church got enough money to give me my first salary, which was $50 a month. And you were not there when we had to share a building with the daycare center. And the exchange for the rent that I couldn't pay is I had to clean up all of the soiled diapers and trash cans that were left in there over the weekend. And I had to clean it as the pastor to make sure that our church and congregation had a place to go and you were not there when I rented a system from a man named Rob Ryder for $200 a month for two 12 inch speakers and one microphone with a six foot cord. And that is where we started our church with 17 seats, with no air condition, no heat, no staff, no salaries, no building. And that is where the Lighthouse Church started. And I stayed focused in spite of those details. And yes, we have air conditioning now. And yes, we have heat now. And yes, our ministry is on acres. But it isn't this place that made me. This place is the beneficiary of the made man that was raised in the dungeons and in the dark and without driving a 96 Buick Regal that was given to me by my mother when it was already on its last leg that those are the details that curated the determination that pushed me into my destiny. Is your determination backed up by desire or fame? Do you care if people know who you are? Or is the objective to fulfill your destiny? I was recently approached by a young man who was a chemist. You'll get it, so he's a chemist and he brought me this detergent. And so I had him to give me a demonstration and you need to listen to me because this is gonna help you. I didn't buy it, you know why? Because when he started washing the clothes, I didn't see any bubbles <laughs> or, or what they call back in my day. I ain't see no suds. Y'all remember that? It was no suds. And I know that when we wash dishes, we need suds. Come on, y'all. When, when, you, when you take a shower, 
you decide which soap is the best by how much suds it give you. I know that word is hilarious. I don't know why I keep saying it, but it there wasn't no suds. And um, I told him, I said, man, um, I can't, I can't support it because it, it ain't no suds. And he said, um, he said, did you not know that pure soap doesn't make suds? He said, that's an artificial additive that is put in the compound for the same reason you're saying it. He's saying suds or bubbles isn't what cleans a thing, but they know that we are addicted to it. So they put it in everything, our face wash. We don't think our face is washed unless it has bubbles. Clothes, because we associate bubbles with clean. He said, what cleans a thing is agitation. That's why the washing machine goes back and forth. It, so it's not the bubbles that's cleaning it, it's the agitation. He says, this is organic soap that has no additives, which is why it has no bubbles. And I thought to myself, how many things have we added to the load of our life that are not actually necessary they are only there because we think we need them. I want you to think about that. We, we, won't, we won't even go forward unless this particular thing is there. Not recognizing that it is an additive that is not necessary to the compound. When Febreze was just, when, when Febreze was made, it had no scent. They couldn't sell it until they added smell because we equate clean with smell. So they, the owners of Febreze created um, an odor blocking compound that would take away the odor of anything. But because it didn't add an odor, they couldn't sell it. They added Hawaiian breeze to it. And so billions of dollars of the same chemical because they added smell. By the way, the smell isn't what kills the smell that you're trying to get rid of. It actually is a neutralizing agent in it that actually neutralizes the smell and the perfume is added because we need certain things added to believe that they work. I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering if we believe that paying attention to the distractions are necessary evils in order to get the job done. Jesus said, I know that I'm gonna be distracted, but I ain't got time for it. I have to work the work of the one who sent me while it is day because the night is coming and I don't have time to focus on the details. The only thing I have time to do is focus on my determined desire. I need you to become more determined in this season than ever before and stop allowing the enemy to make you believe that the irrelevant additives are the reason why you're going to get where you need to be. You have everything in you that you need to get to your next level, but you gotta be determined. Everybody say determined. Number two, the second review I get out of this is Napoleon Hill uses a term called auto-suggestion. Auto suggestion. It's when you learn how to influence your own attitude and mental state of mind. Do you know what that's called? Do you know what it's called when you decide that no matter how a thing looks and how it appears, that you're still going to be okay? Do you know what that's called? I'm gonna give you a clue. It starts with an F. He called it auto suggestion. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. He calls it auto-suggestion, God calls it faith. I told you, they, he, he just robbed the Bible. Um, what, 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 what we call in business R&D, um, it's called research and development in business, but some people call it rob and duplicate. He just, he just took principles of the word of God and put another cover on it and said, here, here you go. And, and millions of people bought it. But auto suggestion is merely faith. I want you to look at Philippians 4 and 10. 
But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Verse 11, now that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am in, therewith to be content. I know both how to abase and to abound. Everywhere in all things, I am, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. What he's saying is, listen, I have taught myself how to operate no matter what the environment is. And this is big, that you have to stop feeling okay only when things are okay. That you have to know how to abase and abound. In other words, I'm going to win whether the economy is up or down. Do you not understand I, who, who I am? Just type in there. Do you know who I am? Somebody type that in there. Do you know who my daddy is? I live in this economy, but my life is set up by another economy called the kingdom. When other people are losing, we're winning. This church that, that, that we started, the Lighthouse Church, ladies and gentlemen, the inaugural year of this church was October of 2009. If you are old enough to remember those days, can I tell you what was happening then? the biggest economic collapse since the Great Depression. General Motors needed a loan from the government to go forward. Everything was crashing. The housing market crashed. People's interest rates went through the roof. Mortgages doubled and tripled. And we created a ministry that got 800 new members in 16 weeks and 1,500 in the first year when other churches and businesses were closing the doors. Faith. Auto suggestion. We created a fail proof in our mind and we said, we're gonna influence our ministry, our attitude and our mental capacity, no matter what's going on around us, greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. And God built a mega ministry in a fallen economy. Faith. You need faith. The size of a mustard seed. You don't need one the size of an acorn. You don't need one the size of a watermelon. Just a small, insignificant, almost invisible to the naked eye mustard seed faith is enough to move a mountain. That's the thing I love about faith. It don't even take a lot of it to get things done. A small amount of faith can do big things. Here's my third thought that I think a lot of people fall into the trap of. Generalization. Here's the third thing. Don't generalize. Don't generalize. When Jesus was describing his purpose, I want you to go to Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Look at Luke chapter 19, verse 10. And, and this will help you. So the Bible says in Luke 19 and 10, here's what the Bible says. It says, for the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost. He chose words filled with so much purpose. He's basically saying, uh, they're saying to him, and I'm gonna paraphrase, you need to stop. I mean, you're gonna lose your life. Um, Zacchaeus, is, is, is this tax guy and you're going to mess up your ministry trying to hang out with people like him. And um, it, that ain't a good look, y'all. That ain't a good look for the church. And, and the Rev, a preach, he ain't got no business around a dude like that. You know, I get that all the time when people uh, will see myself or other ministers around, um, you know, uh, people who are on television and 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 their lives are overly scrutinized by people who actually wish they had their lives but that's a whole another story and people look at you and say what is a preacher doing around that kind of person or what why why are you around that person as if being around a person will make them change their lives and I've never understood this criticism when somebody sees me with somebody from Hollywood and 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 they go to a church or or even our church they'll say how are you around that person and they still live in that way. My question is, I've been around you and you didn't change. 
I mean, it, it happens. It happens. People come to this church every Sunday and they still leave the same way they came. People make their own decisions whenever they want to. But here is my answer to the criticism. I came to seek and save that which is lost. And as long as the church is only comfortable around the found, the lost will never be found. We've got to find comfort in the loss. We got to find comfort in the confused. We got to find comfort in the people who don't know our morals and our values and our mores and our systems and, the, and our trajectory of thought. We, I, I, he said, I came to seek and save that which is lost. So when you see me around a, a tax collector that doesn't have good morals and values and you see me going to his house and eat, just know that that's my mission. That's my mission. And what I'm trying to get you to understand, as long as you try to continue to be uh, a, a neutral as long as you try to be neutral and, 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 and not take a stand, you, you'll, never, you'll never leverage. If you, if you look at doctors, the general practitioners do not get paid as much as the specialist. The doctor who takes the blood pressure and the doctor who, who weighs you and the doctor who draws the blood and the doctor who puts you on the EKG machine and the doctor that does all of this stuff in one day, they make a good living, but the people who are living in the penthouses, they do heart surgery only. The people who own 40 acres and, and, and have mega mansions, all they do is teeth, just, just, just a specific practitioner. The best basketball players in the world don't average five rebounds, five points, five assists, five steals. The best players in the world, they might get you 50 points and two rebounds. Why? Because on a particular day, they specialize in a thing because the people who are paid the most are the ones who specialize in a specific thing. And until you stop generalizing your life and find out this one thing that I desire of the Lord, find your one thing. The problem is, is you have too many things. You want to be a cook and an esthetician, and own a daycare, and be a mechanic, and own a construction business, and be a loan officer. Forget all of that. Find the one thing that he created you for and do it all day, every day. And that one thing will pay you more than 10 things. You got to stop being general. And you have to become a specialist. Wealth is set aside for the specialist. Purpose is set aside for the specialist. You can't be a prophet, a teacher, a bishop, and a prayer warrior all at the same time. You may be able to do all of them, but find out what you're, are you a teacher? Then teach. Are you a prophet? Prophesy. Are you a bishop? Then lead. But don't try to be all things because he who stands in the middle of the road gets hit by both sides and you will be the master of all in your mind. You will be the master of all in your mind, but you can't master it all. I heard it said this way. You could be the jack of all trades, but the master of none. You can't be a mechanic and a chef on the same day, who, who's to understand? I don't want you in my car smelling like spaghetti and I don't want grease in my beans. Which one are you going to be? Special. You don't have the cook. Think about this. You went to a restaurant and the cook got off of the table wherever they were paying the food from the deep fryer. Imagine you went to a restaurant and the cook left the kitchen and took the trash out with the same hands. I'm out. Because I need everybody in this restaurant to be a specialist. I need the garbage people on the garbage and I need the fry people on the fries and I don't need my fry man being the person cleaning the bathroom. Specialist. Find one thing. 
I came to seek and save that which is lost. So when you try to get me off target and you try to get me off kilter and you try to get me off of, I, I'm not worried about none of that because right now I'm seeking the loss. I am trying to tell you to use your imagination to find out. By the way, by the way, let me stop there. By the way, I just thought of something else. There are two types of imaginations. There is the synthetic imagination and there is the creative imagination. Let me just stop there. Help me, Holy Ghost. The synthetic imagination allows you to reaffirm that which already exists. But a creative imagination allows you to dream up new ideas. Hmm. I'm afraid that there are too many synthetic ideas in the world. You cannot take somebody else's idea and pretend it's yours and get success. You can add on the idea, you can improve on the idea, but you can't steal it. That's why I tell our staff all the time, you don't have to worry about somebody recreating an idea that you have. It'll never get done the way you thought it up if you stay authentic to yourself and its purpose. Now, one of these imagination trains of thoughts get you in trouble. The synthetic imagination you can get away with. The creative imagination gets you in trouble um, because some people love to criticize people who have new ideas. I'm, I'm gonna give you an example in the Bible. You remember when Joseph was in the pit? As long as Joseph saw what his brothers saw, he was fine. But the moment he saw something they didn't see, the moment he saw them bowing and they didn't see themselves bowing, he found himself in a pit because people who run into a person who has original ideas often gets criticized by the people who are too intimidated to imagine. So people who have no imagination settle for attack. So if you're going to have the courage to imagine and no longer be general and become specific and specialize in something, you will find yourself in a pit. I feel ministry happening right there because some of y'all are sticking out like sore thumbs, misunderstood because of the gift that you're stirring up inside of you. And you didn't ask for it. You didn't politic for it. It was given to you by God. And because you are not average, your attacks are extraordinary. But hang on because everything is going to be all right because the Lord has need of you. And he will let, or he will withhold no good thing from you. Glory to God. The last thing I need you to do is I need you to turn your plan. Let me say it this way. I need you to turn your idea into a plan. Oh, I don't know how many people I meet with ideas. What if Jesus came to the earth and said, I have an idea. I'm going to save as many people as I can. And then went back to Nazareth and got a job as a carpenter and never came back to Cana or to the Sea of Galilee or any other places he went. No, he had a plan. He, he, he said, I, I'm seeking to save that which is lost. That's my, that's my idea, but here's my plan. Luke chapter two, I'm gonna get 70 disciples and I'm gonna send them out two by two. And we are now Christians because he sent the first 70 out two by two. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? 
you got to find your idea and turn it into a plan and you have to avoid procrastination. And you have to be persistent. For three years, Jesus didn't stop. What if I told you you're going to have to work for three years straight, bleeding, criticized, confused, tired, three years straight before your vision even kicks off. He worked three years to get 70 disciples. You, you'd be amazed at how many people want more out of three years than even Jesus got. Took him three years to get 70 people who will go and work for him full time. It might take you three years to get that company off the ground. It might take you three years to get your footing in that marriage. It may take you three years to understand your role as a parent. It may take you three years to get that church off the ground, pastor, but they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I need you to turn your idea into a plan. Write the vision and make it plain. Now watch this, and I'm done. Write the vision, make it plain, that they who read it will run with it. Write the vision, make it plain, that they who read it may run with it. Did you not know that when you have a vision, the only responsibility you have at first is to think of it. They will run with it. I told you to be a specialist. If you will specialize in writing the vision, God will surround you with people who specialize in running with it. But when you want to write it and run it, you become general and eventually irrelevant. Turn your ideas into a plan. Don't be general, become a specific practitioner. Faith the size of a mustard seed and desires that are backed up by determination. I, I hope this helps. Um, don't be like that family who was three feet away from striking gold. Like, I wanna put this down so you can look at me because you've been with me for 17 weeks. And over this last 17 weeks, I'm sure some of you have been watching, talking about God, when is it gonna be my turn? And you are just about to give up on this day. But don't throw in the towel the day before the miracle. I'm gonna give you this and I'm gonna receive our gifts and I want you to really think about this. I moved to Houston, as I said earlier, in the year 2008, church started in 2009. And if anybody's ever been to Houston, we got freeways everywhere. We got 59, we got 45, we got 290, 294, I-10, 610, Beltway 8, 99, Highway 6, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Uh, one of the freeways that was by the place that I lived at that time is called West Park Tollway. And I got on West Park Tollway, didn't realize it was a toll road because where I come from, there were none. I rode on that road for six months and got a bill at my address for $2,000 uh, because I stayed on the road without knowing its cost. And for six months, I rode on the road and didn't know its cost. It's expensive to drive up a street that you know nothing about. So I knew that road. But since it cost, I got off of that road. Found another road. Way more traffic, but it was free. It's called 45. If you know anything about 45 in Houston, uh, the devil has a speed pass on 45. It's the worst traffic, some of the worst traffic in Houston. Because I want to drive for free, my route was longer, more people, because everybody likes the general road. So I took myself 
off of this specified road that costs, put myself in general population, my speed slows down. One day I'm on this road and I'm driving and I don't know the area well, so it's taking me so long. I'm used to getting to this destination quickly. 20 minutes, I'm not there. 30 minutes, I'm not there. If you've ever been to Houston, you just know it's gonna take you 30 to 45 minutes to get anywhere. I'm driving, can't find what I'm looking for. Pull over at a gas station, frustrated, getting ready to make a U-turn. I say to the person at the gas station, where is this place? Um, and at that time I was driving to our church, uh, which was, uh, we were renting a TV station. We called it the hot box because it didn't have any air conditioning. And West Park used to take you there, but I, I didn't have the money. So I had to take 45 to get there. And the exit is the beltway here. And I stopped and asked for directions. The man told me, he said, oh, you're about two exits away. Two more exits that way and you'll be there. I drove for 30 minutes and was ready to make a U-turn because I got tired two exits before my off-ramp. I'm wondering how many of you watching me you're thinking and you want to grow rich and you want to grow wealthy and you want to be successful. You're getting ready to give. But you don't have two more exits in you. Two more Sundays, two more months, two more prayer meetings, two more books, two more chapters in the Bible, just two more. And you're going to strike gold if you faint not. Keep digging. Keep digging. The race is not given to the swift nor the strong, but the one that endures to the end. And you're not going to get yours when she got hers, and she's not going to get hers when you got yours, but you have an appointed time. And that appointed time is when you go from being general to specific. I want you to get a specific seed in your hand right now, not an old general seed, not a, a $5 seed like you normally do, $10, $20. I want you to get a specific seed. For some of you all, you might need... I hear, I hear this in my head, $22,000 to finish a project. You might want to be specific and so $222. I want, I want everybody's seed to be specific to something that they need in their life. And I want you to say, God, I am picking this seed to show you how specific I am going to be in the next season, how intentional I am going to be. I'm not going to let, I'm not going to float into a gift today. I'm going to be specific in what I sow. I have five children, so I'm sowing $5 on behalf of every children. Whatever it is, I want you to be specific. I got three business plans that I want to do, and I'm going to give three seeds. Whatever it is, I want you to give right now, and I'm going to pray over you. God, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray specifically over these individuals who are about to release into the kingdom something that they actually need to survive. Let no person who is sacrificial lack. And I pray that you will pour out on them a blessing they won't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, my brothers. Those are my thoughts, my sisters, on Think and Grow Rich, simply more than the Bible expose. We're gonna do it again next week. I can't wait to see you. God bless you, and I love you. What an amazing time we had in the service today. The word was phenomenal. Listen. If you haven't had an opportunity to join our church, the information is on the screen. We want to connect with you. Or maybe you're saying, hey, I just want to sow a seed into what they're doing right there at the Lighthouse Church. Well, listen, the information is also down on the screen. We want to help you connect to a greater mission. Listen, I want to pray with you because the word today, I know has settled in someone's spirit. It's changing your life. So come on, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just want to say thank you just for everything that was said today. God, we thank you, Lord, for all the ears and the hearts that received this word because we know that you're channeling them and transferring them and pushing them into a new dimension in you. God, we just want to ask, God, that you lift them up. Whatever the issue is in life, we pray, God, that you deal with it and work it out right now. God, we just want to say thank you. All these blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name, amen. Listen, we can't wait to connect with you. Remember, share this message. Share this on, on every platform you have. Someone needs to hear this word. We love you. Can't wait to see you again. Bye-bye.
What's going on family? If you're watching this video, you've already decided that you feel my vibe. You already have decided that you like something about the Lighthouse Church. And guess what? We are looking for people to minister to who look just like you, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who believe he is the sustainer and creator of the world. And we use this social media internet platform to spread the gospel all across the world and that includes coming directly into your house. Lighthouse 2.0 is simply a group of people who say, you know what? We either can't make it to the sanctuary or we don't live in the city, but we love the ministry that is coming out of that house. And guess what? We view you as one of our own. So I want you to tag, text, or tweet anybody you know that needs to hear a word from God. Share this thing so that way we can actually be in line with the Great Commission, going ye therefore into all the world, teaching people about Jesus Christ. Lighthouse 2.0, that means that you are a part of our family and you are friends that we have never met, but soon hope we can. Oh, and by the way, can I tell you what I tell all of the people who stand in line? Give me 1% of your trust. I'll earn the other 99. Give me one year of your life and God will change it. God bless you, Lighthouse 2.0. I'll see you hopefully online or in person.